A little while later, the crew entered the Vespucci D cockpit. It was similarly ergonomic, with control panels at the front, a metal truss between the two main control stations, and a window allowing a view of the outside world. I surely never expected the cockpit to look like this, thought secondary engineering specialist Sean Sutherland, who had expected a somewhat sleeker room. Sutherland was a handsome Afro-American man of 31 years, who had previously served as a repair technician in the Union of Libertarian States Air Force, or ULSAF. Like Commander Kormanoff, he too was very much attracted to Isabella, though he never had the chance to admit it. At 10 o'clock a.m., Greenwich Mean Time, the crew of the Vespucci began, getting ready to prepare for launch. Radio is on and active, all power breakers active, and buzzer ramjet is activated, announced Isabella. Commander Kormanoff continued, Roger, activating reaction control thrusters, transferring power to the reactor. The sound of reactor powering up was then heard all across the ship. Separation in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, Isabella stated. The grappling tubes were then released, freeing the Vespucci D to move in whatever direction that the crew wished. Commander Kormanoff then announced, Engines firing in Daishat, Daiviat, Vazim, Shem, Shest, Piat, Cheddary, Tri, Va, Ahem, Noel. The engine roar, created by several hundred tons of plasma blasting out of the engine nozzles, was quite loud on the inside of the Vespucci. Yet it was completely silent on the outside of the 500-meter-long space vessel, where the lack of any medium made the sound was impossible to vibrate. Soon the Vespucci D was moving away from the assembly matrix at a rate that increased by 2.2 meters per second every second. Katrina, is the reactor stable? Asked the commander, trying to be heard through the considerable engine noise. The primary engineering specialist, a 28-year-old Afro-American engineering school graduate, responded, Yes, Commander, the reactor is currently stable and functional. As the space vessel slowly used up its fuel, the engines became more powerful. Isabella set these equations into the flight computer and bring us into a lunar orbit, ordered Kormanoff, again struggling to be heard. The orbital entry equations were then entered into the Vespucci's flight computer, and the ship slowly turned around using its RCS thrusters and fired the engines. The next day, the Vespucci D entered range of the Aurora Science Station. The station was spinning wildly on all three axes and had lost a great deal of its aft section from the explosion. The docked Unity shuttle had moved away from the station at a rate of about 0.442 km per hour as it followed it in orbit. Both vessels had not only lost a large amount of orbital momentum, but had been knocked into a completely new orbital path. Normally, the polar orbital path took them over Russia, India, and Antarctica, but now it was moving considerably westward. Amazingly, despite the violence of the explosion, the space station was mostly intact. Yuri Kormanov, Isabella Cellini, Michael Cameron, and Cassie Fry proceeded separately towards the unoccupied hatches and donned their spacesuits. If they had all taken the main hatch at a rate of one at a time, the whole operation would have taken too long. As soon as the decompression process was completed, they disembarked. Their spacesuits were sleek, skin suits that applied pressure to the skin rather than the suit. This made them considerably less bulky than the really old suits of the 1980s. As the pilot and commander moved away from their hatches using the RCS thrusters attached to their suits, Michael and Cassie began looking for the Unity shuttle using a handheld infrared sensor. As Commander Kormanoff and Isabella approached the damaged station, they tried to be careful not to get whacked by the station structure. At the time that the two had about 100 meters left to reach the station, a piece of the station's centrifuge got dangerously close to Isabella and almost hit her helmet, nearly cracking the visor. She then gave the spinning space station the finger and cursed in Italian before returning to normal. Sorry about that, Commander, Isabella apologized. The Commander then responded, That's okay, Isabella. I sure wouldn't want to have a cracked helmet, either. At that moment, the two fired their forward-facing suit thrusters to slow down and began to slowly drift towards the station. 
They then attached themselves to the Aurora station's exterior using a hooked rope and moved down towards the station's docking hatches. The constant motion was somewhat nauseating, but the two were experienced enough that they were not affected by the threat of nausea. Commander Kormanov then started blurting, Hey, Isabella, did you know that my father participated in the construction of the Colorus Cosmodrome, something totally unrelated to the current crisis? At that, Isabella responded, That's very interesting, Commander, but can we please focus on the current problem? Those people are going to die within 72 hours unless we get them out of there. Soon, Kormanov and Cellini were at the docking ports. Isabella then decompressed and opened the closest airlock, and the two began to enter the doomed space station. Isabella detected a slight hint of flirtation in the commander's Russian-accented voice. She asked him, Commander, may I ask you a personal question? The commander replied, Sure, why not? The pilot then began, Commander, I know that you are strongly attracted to me, but I think that you should know that I don't feel the same towards you. Can we please just remain acquaintances? Commander Kormanov gave it some thought and finally decided that she was right. As a symbolic gesture, the two shook hands. Just out of curiosity, is there anyone to whom you are attracted? Kormanov asked his pilot. Yes, there is. I think that I might be having feelings for Sean Sutherland. Commander Kormanov was somewhat surprised, but at the same time understood her. Yeah, he's a fairly attractive man, perfect for such a beautiful and intelligent woman as yourself. I think that the two of you would make a great couple. The Vespucci D had passed the orbit of Mars and into the asteroid belt, a surprisingly clear region with an occasional large piece of pure metal. The crew had encountered a small, previously unnamed binary companion of one of these metal chunks, 710068 Monica Volucci, which they named 710070 Isabella Cellini. For the past two years, the vessel had been peacefully moving frictionless across the solar system, towards the tiny ice pack of a planet called Pluto. Every few months, however, the peace was disrupted by a series of minor and often inevitable technical malfunctions caused by the use of American manufactured parts. Although most of the computer parts were made by Japan's Matamaru Corporation, sometimes the vessel's constructors added in American parts from smaller corporations. This meant that sometimes missing or corrupted files occasionally showed up. At this point, that was exactly the case. Or was it? Melinda, slightly confused by Isabella's statement, replied, No, it's not a ghost who's trying to communicate with you. It's a human, probably Sean Sutherland. Isabella gave it a thought, and finally decided, No, it's probably another one of those odd technical malfunctions, likely a high end bug, although I have no idea what would have caused the advert to appear. Melinda changed the subject and asked, Hey, Izzy, may I call you that? Isabella replied, Yes, you may call me whatever you want. Anyway, have you told Sean about how you feel towards him yet? Melinda continued. The pilot responded, No, just between all of my work piloting the ship and performing scientific analyses on what we find I haven't had much time for social life. Melinda had neglected to mention that on the previous day, while observing the two asteroids, she'd had a conversation with Sean after noticing that he had seemed distracted. After asking him what the problem was, he replied that he had been thinking about Isabella. Melinda's response, in turn, was, yeah, that makes sense. She's certainly very beautiful. Maybe you should tell her how you feel. I'm sure she'll understand. That pretty much concludes this operation. As you can obviously tell, there is plenty more to be explored in this novel. Sifan Esther 92 hopes to publish his novel by the end of this year, or possibly sometime next year. Once it is published, you will get the opportunity to see for yourself where everything is leading up to. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this little sneak peek. This is HAL9000, signing off.